For me, it was like uh, three of December of 2009, I heard about in, in Somali media about one of my friends who makes suicide in bomb in Denmark, in Somalia. And that time was, I was shocked, I was confused, I was angry, and I was like, I, I cannot believe it about this happening in my community and even my own people in Somalia. So I was just like saying, I want to find out, I want to make research about why these young people, I know them, I grew up with them, was nice people and play with, with them football and why they're going to the culture they don't know, the religion that maybe they don't know about it and, and the country they don't know about it, why they go there and make suicide bomb. And that's why I started the idea. And after that, the idea, I go to the Southern. And after that, we've been this working the last eight years. And we actually met uh, a few years before that, uh, when Nasib came to our uh, production company at that point with, a, with an idea to do something about the piracy. So we've known each other for like 2008. Yeah. Eight, yeah. yeah. 11, 11 years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the the term warrior covers uh, covers a lot of this the perception that these guys have of themselves, mm -hmm. especially uh, in the first film, uh, because there was this element of resistance against the the Ethiopian uh, army that had invaded Somalia at that time. So a lot of the 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 rationale for joining Al Shabaab at that point was that they were freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. And they were fighting for an independent Somalia without the Ethiopians, who are Christians, being there. So, so they they saw themselves very much as warriors, and and I think it was a, a term that covered the both the, the the way they saw themselves and also the way that I think we we saw them. Uh, and warriors can be a, a good thing and a bad thing, <laughs> and, and and those are the nuances that we from the very beginning. Uh, wanted to to look at how do they see themselves and how do we see them and for me it's like uh, like you say I'm agree with you and from north it means about because we I'm searching most of them the young people who come from Scandinavia so it's like the most young people we speak about is from north that's why mm. yeah which was actually um, an interesting mm. uh, thing that I didn't know either that that uh, most of the people in, who, who committed the suicide attacks in Somalia, they were from the diaspora, either from, from Europe or from North America, because that notion of blowing yourself up was very uh, uh, strange yeah, for, for a Somali person yeah, in Somalia. Because the, the Somali people, they believe that if you make suicide bomb, you go to the hell. So this is the opposite about our religious and way and to lock people think about it because you can fight one, you can kill a person, but you can never make suicide bomb. It's the, you never get forgiveness from the God. That they believe it, local people. And this is why where I come from this idea to make suicide bomb, from which country they come from, where they get this idea, why these diaspora young people there from living outside and have better life and make kill themselves because these local people, they don't have nothing and they want to survive, but they don't want to kill themselves. And they're afraid about it. They want to search. They want to get a better life for them. And these young people from diaspora is like, they have everything and they don't care about what they're losing and their own family and their own society. I think it's international Modi actually like in Jihadi, because in, I, never, I never believe that if somebody tell me about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, something like that said, Somali guy, he, he, can, he, he will make suicide, but I, I never say never. Because that time I was believing, because the culture we grow up, we don't have it, a suicide bomb. You can fight your hands or you can kill with a gun person, but you can never kill yourself because you have to, have, you have to leave it. That's why you're fighting. But in this idea, I think it's come from, from international and jihadist and from maybe two times on one, the idea come from. But the only Somalian local people, they never know that. It's, it's still yet because you cannot get in local people to kill himself or herself. And that's why I still think this has come from all things from diaspora who know about technology and have 
networking and media, international media. So these people, they know more than think how to do the bomb, and how to make suicide bomb, and, and how to kill himself. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's, it comes, like you said, partly from the inequality of the, the resources. Uh, the people that are terrorists are, are represents the poor, <laughs> the, and and the people who have the big uh, war machinery is of course uh, the power. So 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 when when you are powerless and resourceless, then you have yet yeah, then you come up with with other ways of of, uh, of fighting the war, and I think that that is really a part of it. Probably also in in, in Palestine, Israel, where. Where we saw a lot of it uh, back in the, back in the nineties. Mm. So using the body as a weapon when you don't have, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. For me, it was this, um, I think if 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 I should pinpoint one thing that is the primary driver for for the radicalization, I would say it's the social isolation that mm -hmm. that these young men and sometimes also girls experience in the Western society. And and um, that social isolation, which is is both uh, economically and culturally, and and the way uh, the way you are living and and everything, and and the fact that um, um, these people don't they don't see that they have a public voice. No nobody speaks for them. They they don't have anyone that they can uh, relate to that represents them. I think that is, that is a key factor in the in the in the radicalization, um, as as far as I think that I wh what I've learned from from these uh, eight years of work, and and uh, and thus it's also where I think you, we should work to de-radicalize and to prevent the radicalization. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like uh, sometimes I think about, especially in Denmark or Scandinavian, but most in Denmark, it's like the media talk about immigrant or especially the people I talk about is most of them Somalian people and background Somalian. And for me, it's like, the everything, since I come in Denmark was the only thing I hear about Somali talking about general in media is about bad things. Mm -hmm. And that's why the people there are almost like saying everything, we, the only thing about they talk about is about us, but they don't never talk about with us. So how uh, how can I trust them? The media they're just making like propaganda or talking about only bad things about Somalia, and these young people they are vulnerable and sometimes they are angry and uh, and was debate was in Denmark is very hard in Somalia. If you are Somali, you can never integrate into society. You cannot be part of society. So and after that was Muhammad Karton come inside and this. They get more tools and more uh, radicalized. As an example of of the the radicalization of the debate and of the uh, how we we deal with with uh, with these problems in Denmark is that the government has made a so-called ghetto plan, which, a bit simplified, um, states that if you live in these designated areas that they call a ghetto, and there's uh, factors that, that define if it's a ghetto, how many immigrants live there, how many have uh, uh, marks on their, uh, have problems with the law, uh, and how many are, is on welfare, etc. Then you are subject to another kind of legal uh, principle that you can get punished in, in more severe ways, you can get punished uh, in, a, in a collective way if, if somebody in your family, a kid, uh, gets in conflict with the law, uh, the whole family can be thrown out of the apartment. Uh, and uh, it, it basically means that the people already living in this area that, that undeniably has a lot of problems are getting even more stigmatized and, and gets, uh, they experience that that because they belong to that uh, class in our society, they they are even they are worth even less, and that's what is actually happening in Denmark right now. For me, it's like uh, I live this ghetto places myself, mm. so I know how the people feeling about it because you don't believe you don't trust about the system, you don't trust the police, you don't trust about justice, and you feel like people when you 
politician and media talking about they talking about you and them and you don't feel like you are part of society you feel like you're outsider and and it's very sad to see many young people or many children they grow up this hatred somehow and uh, and they don't feel part of the society we're living about it because they already even they born there so even they are just 10 years old they are they saying I'm not uh, this part of society because they always like I get punishment twice I get uh, they make me hard to live there they make me hard to stay there so so even you can see they don't, you don't trust the system and the police you don't if you have a problem you have to run the police and, and connect it, but you don't run there because you afraid of them and so it's very sad to see this and you get afraid that your kids are being taken, will away, be taken from away from you, you and, and you react in, in certain ways to that, you, you defend yourself. So we have to build this bridge, like the, the parents and the people who are living there, they have to have trust in the system and have trust to police and go in there. Even if I, I see my son or my daughter going to the classes, I have to call the police and say, I, I think, can you help me with this? But if you don't believe the system, how can you go there? Where to go there? So that's the difficult question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and I think it's it's uh, it's very universal, and it's not even that. I mean, it's not like a total revelation. It's it's like common knowledge that that young people are searching for an identity, and 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 if you're not as a society willing to let them in to take part of that numerous identities that you can provide as a society. You either react by resenting that society or maybe developing some kind of internal problems for yourself. Or, or you find some subculture where you actually feel that you belong. Mm -hmm. And in these cases, it's a, it's a destructive sub subculture. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the mechanisms that I think we really need to understand and, and, uh, and accept. And, and um, the point for, for us, I think, is that it's, it's not an isolated phenomenon. We are also, as a society, playing a role in that, in that radicalization. Because we tend to look at this person who did something wrong and, and, and pointing to him and say, you are wrong, you have done something wrong, we put you to prison. But we never look to ourselves and say, okay, <laughs> what is the role that we are playing in his radicalization? What is it that we provide to this young person uh, in forms of uh, inclusion in, in, into society? And what is the, what do we, how do we present our society to him as one that, that welcomes him and, and gives him opportunities or one that isolates him because he's Muslim or he's black or he's uh, living in the, in the ghetto or whatever it is? Mm. For me, it's like um, my experience, my own self, because I try to be their shoes. So I, mm. if I talk about it, it's like sometimes you be angry because you feel like you are part of society and you're trying very hard to be part of them. And you feel like you are, for example, for me, like I feel like I was Danish in the beginning. But after that, some people coming and say, you can never be Danish because you don't have the right color. You don't have the right name or even you look, you, you go to the club in the night. They say you cannot come inside because you have the wrong color again, and and still, so you get some hate, hatred somehow, and you feel like I want to I want to belong somewhere else because I I cannot fit inside here because I'm trying my best, but I always get like rejected. So for me, it's like um, an education. Also, it's very hard to play. Yeah, because you, you want to take care of yourself, you want to get your own money, and but in, even you're trying to come inside in the market and to get uh, some work, it's very hard to get because you don't have the right name again. So for me, it's like uh, you have to be like you you have to accept it. These people, this uh, different color, maybe they have it, and society they have to accept it and say this is they are part of us, and we have to accept it. We are and they are part of society and we have to include it in the country. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, and I think many young people will change their mind after that. But if you feel like always you are outsider, so you never come inside. So it's very hard to try again and again mm -hmm. because sometimes you have to give up. 
how long you try. So. And also because if uh, there is this tool that that because you're 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 from abroad, you have maybe you have a passport, maybe you don't. But but uh, there's always the threat of being kicked mm. out, mm. <laughs> totally kicked out of that country that you maybe have been in like since you were three years old or eight years old. Yeah. For me, it's like this. Is my uh, when I speak w with them, my friends, it's like it's like um, some of them like already vulnerable because they like um, they have the, the idea is about they can never be part of the society. Then they have tried already and they give up and they cannot change nothing. The only they can change it is to go where they can belong somewhere. And when I speak with them, it's like they're saying, I want to find a place where I can be my religious or my cultural or my language and I be part of them. Even I don't have to think about it, where I am, which kind of color I have it, which kind of name I have it. But still, in also about the family have to play the, the, you know, the role. Some of them, they, have, they don't have a father role and father role model. So they have only lived with uh, single mothers or their only mothers so they they don't have the father rules and that's why they don't have to some who have education or trying to live in his work or something like that so they always like they lost in this two cultural and they don't know where they belong belong to them and they're very hard to be like they they cannot speak their parents because they they don't have to ed uh, education in this country they're living they don't speak their language they cannot help with them wherever they need it mm -hmm. so it's like for them it's like they see like parents like they are failure already so they don't have no role models mm -hmm. like I said before it's like father rules that's mm -hmm. why because mother she always keep the daughter home most of them and maybe making food together each other and we maybe the young boy he just ar moving around and playing outside and making some meeting some young mm -hmm. another guys and make some gangster things or drugs or something like that that's why i think so boys have a bit more freedom to freedom in, yeah 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 i think as well there's a like a masculinity mm. to the whole yeah, thing, the costumes so. and the guns, the guns. and the, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. Of course, there, there is an element of, you know, there is an element of action. action. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in our first film, the, he also talks about that. There is, there is this element of uh, doing something that is not uh, abstract, that is very concrete. And I mean, what's more concrete than having a gun and, and, and the idea of going to War is uh, can appeal to to or be soldier mm -hmm. maybe yeah yeah, yeah. and the <clears throat> first time I got there was um, established about uh, local journalists to meet there and find them because I cannot be every time there and I cannot make research all the year so we get uh, I get some friends who are working there in Mogadishu local journalists who are staying there and making research for us, and they contact them all of them, and the only thing we have to be there is when we're making recording or something like that. So we ne we never meet them face to face like. Mm. And what about the um, so the guy you interviewed in that? film uh was he one of your friends the guy who wants to remain wanted to remain anonymous yeah the shadow guy shadow guy yeah, yeah. <laughs> the shadow guy he's still living in denmark and copenhagen place and now his life is going better way and uh, because he was the same groups but in, he decided to stay in denmark because he got the uh, he think about the thing they're going, he, he's not belong there and he don't want to fight for fighting for just for killing so, another Somali people. So he tried to decide to stay in Denmark and he's still, he life, he's still, he trying his best, but his life is like up and down because he drink too much and take some, so many drugs to forget mm -hmm. about it. Everything happened, his past life. And there was also this because he has he has a he has a conscience and he and he realized that this carnage that you see when when uh, when war is playing out or when terror is playing out it 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 didn't it didn't um, 
make him feel good. It mm. made him feel like hell. And I mean, and he, he could feel deep inside him that this is not right. Mm -hmm. And and uh, lo luckily, that 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 feeling uh, prevailed over over the feeling of you know wanting to to fight the Ethiopians or wanting to fight the government in in Somalia. So I I guess it's it's a very delicate. Um, delicate uh, what drives one to to actually go and blow himself up and the other one to stay at home it, that's a very thin line I think sometimes mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that's also worth remembering when we talk ab about uh, preventing radicalization or, or doing the de-radicalization um, that the, thin, the the line can sometimes be blurry and and very thin Mm. And and it, it still I think depends on what kind of you know relationships do you have with other people. Is somebody listening to you? Is is there somebody that you can identify with? You, you call it a role model, but yeah. is there somebody that you actually want to listen to that feels relevant to you when you are a young person of eighteen or, or nineteen years old? Uh, that 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 is very important. It, it was definitely an issue for for the guys we we interviewed for the for the first film uh, that that um, they saw and they listened to people talking about Muslims being being repressed everywhere in the world and and um, in in all kinds of different ways and that that is what they wanted to to fight that oppression of their their brothers and sisters mm -hmm. so that was a, a, a very big factor and and it's used of course in the propaganda of the of the uh, the, the recruiters uh, that that feeling of uh, you know we are being repressed and we have to act against that and of course it's an easy card to to uh, to play mm -hmm. because it's true they, they, i mean they are repressed many 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 places in the world yeah, yeah. We, we, the way we did it was that um, the part of the film that takes place in London with the Fatis family, it was Nasib and uh, a cinematographer and assistant director called Anita Hoplan who was there uh, because we felt that if I and our normal cinematographer, who is a white guy like me, were trampling around in this little house, it would be very difficult to, to gain the trust of the family and especially the mother. Uh, who is like the, the head of the family. So, so uh, it worked out very well that Nasib and Anita was there, um, being, being there for a long time. I think time was uh, an essential f factor. There's, you know, just being there, hanging out, but you can tell more about that, how important that was. And it's also important to speak the same language yeah. and no cultural and that make easier for me and to talk about it and and the only thing was is like, but we don't want to we just be there and just make it we don't tell about we're doing this way now we're doing this time and we have to make this a two hour to finish it we have we use it whole days just like maybe we make it about half an hour to recording that day all day but we give the time to be themselves and to talk about it and forget about their camera inside and we are filming about it and be themselves so to make that, um, and sometimes it's not big house and small house, and you have to every time is some people coming in and out. So you have to always know what time you have to make it. <laughs> you have to shoot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It seemed so small, and I was like, "Where is the camera?" <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, yeah, and and uh, with the. With Mohammed's family in Mogadishu, it was a, a different process because there are so many security issues that we could not work in the same way as 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 we used to do. We had to we had to um, to move around all the time and 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 plan a lot in in advance. You couldn't use the same you couldn't use time in the same way that you did in London yeah. because we had so restricted uh, rules because of the the security situation. So we had to work more like we, we are setting up this scene. Mohammed speaks to his mother about this and that, or Mohammed speaks to his uncle about this and that, because of the security issues and the way we had to work in Mogadishu. And so that was a whole other process of, 
of, and, of and we cannot go her mother his mother's uh, local no. uh, lo local position where she living so and make film there but we have to take from her from there because our security to stay with us so it's it's opposite yeah and you cannot around when you're making movie in Mugdisha uh, in the street location so it's very hard to be there more than half an hour or something like that you have to make very quickly because you never know when al Shwab makes suicide bomb yeah i mean there's that moment in the film where i didn't know was it the government or when they're on the balcony and mm. it's all lovely and like mm. the next thing there's an explosion and a yeah. The soldier yeah. <laughs> that just happened that, that just happened, happened yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and there were i mean i also had to you know realize okay there's there's people with guns everywhere <laughs> and that's it and and some of the heavy guns and they're driving around in trucks with, with big heavy guns and you never know if they're affiliated with with government or police or some kind of private militia belonging to some guy or if they are if they are al-shabaab you you never really know and these guy who who started shooting uh, warning shots above our heads, they were they were uh, private security. You could call yeah. that for for some living down down, down down the hill, yeah. and they just felt like we couldn't be there, so they started shooting. And um, yeah. you don't have to shoot back. If you shoot back, you lost in Somalia yeah. because they accelerated very fast. <clears throat> Luckily, our our very our. Our security team reacted in the, in the perfect way. They mm -hmm. uh, by not shooting back, but mm -hmm. but approaching them and and giving them a hard time. Yeah, the things I have collected because I work in this long time, so uh, I get so many friends there and I trust them and and I know they have good person and they have good heart and and when you have two white person with me and they, everybody can take hostages. <laughs> so mm. I have to be careful to film person who not take it like $100 or $200 if somebody give them and they just make me like, so I have to find the good person and I'm so lucky, very lucky mm. to find the good They were brilliant. Yeah, yeah. nice friends. God, so Soren could have been hostage. Yeah, <laughs> everybody could be hostage, yeah. yeah. But uh, I felt very safe actually yeah. with with these guys and with Nasib, and because they 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 know every inch of the city, they know what to do and what definitely not to do, and and as long as you follow their rules and not start to oppose, no, I want to do this, oh, I want to go sh shopping or <laughs> or whatever, you just do what the what these guys say that you do, and then you're then you're fine. Because the most of them white people who coming there are journalists, uh, they have to take big cars, Amazon, who yeah. uh, too much big uh, body car. You cannot make movie and you cannot go around the um, street. You cannot film in the street. So it's very hard. So you have to think about it. Also, you're making the movie and this guy is about Al Shabaab, uh, but you don't have to have so many security who taking give information to the government or to give him, giving uh, information to Al Shabaab. You have to careful that, and sometimes you have to careful don't have so many intention yourself because you're saying how many car you needed, how many security you needed. Did you need Amazon security? Did you need West? Um, so all of the, all of things I decided to not have it because we don't need attention for mm. ourselves. Yeah. 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 No, and and also, I would feel it, and uh, I would feel very strange if we arrive with helmets and you know a <coughs> bulletproof vest <laughs> and saying press on the back. I mean that's 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 not the kind of film that we wanted to do. Yeah. I mean and and that way Nasib and his team managed us to to have security but have it in a dis in a discreet way yeah. you could say that mm -hmm. i mean and how would uh, muhammad's mother react if she came and met <laughs> guys with helmets <laughs> white guys with helmets uh, and and bulletproof vests yeah. vests i mean how interested are these people really in my life if they if they act like that so yeah. so it was important to find the right balance yeah. between feeling secure and being secure and also being able to to have a presence and and uh, to move around and talk to people, because in Somalia the, we don't have any institution, because uh, everything is clubs since in 1991, so the only thing is back and you can get your justice or moral or th who can defend your personality is like uh, tribes or clan, so 
The only thing you have to know that the clan system, you have to know that how you can survive, if you have to know that which kind of uncle you have it or in the military or with the police, if you have some problem, the police, you can call them or it's opposite. If you have also Al Shawab uncle, you have to you know how to you have to know that also if you can call him when you need it. So so you have to find another way to survive and navigate it um, because yeah, and the people they are very traumatized and you cannot believe everybody and so you have to be very justice and try to be calm and don't get so many attention and be like local people. Yeah. Yeah. It's my advice. But I, th I think that it's part of the, the complexity of the radicalization problem, and and it's 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 uh, it's an aspect of it that we don't talk so much about. That within the community, there's a lot of there's generation gaps. There's uh, there's uh, different ways of seeing the world. There's there's different needs with new generations, and and, and those conflicts are very much alive, of course, within the families, as they are in in every family in the world. Um, and, and that part of it never really plays any role. Uh, there's, um, there's the religious conflict, uh, how religious do you have to be to be accepted uh, by your family, to be appreciated by your family. That's also an issue that, that Mohammed uh, has a lot of uh, uh, fights with in his head. So that and it touches upon identity, it touches upon culture, and it touches also upon um, the fact that, that he was sent away when, when he was a small child without his parents. And that, of course, is a trauma. No matter how much you talk about it, no matter how, how much you get psychology help or, or therapeutic help, it's a trauma that, that you, your parents actually sent you away. And they, they did it for very good reasons to, to make sure he survived. But, but, uh, but I don't think that we really appreciate how difficult that is to, to, uh, to grasp w within yourself when, when, you're, when you're a young man. And, and those conflicts are very much alive within Mohammed's family, uh, together with his feeling of being a Londoner, much more than, than a Somali. But, but I think those conflicts are universal. Everybody can relate to those conflicts because they're, they're in different kinds of shapes and forms uh, present in, in most families. And I think it was, um, uh, it sounds strange, but it was kind of a gift to the film that, that uh, Mohammed and his mother were w willing to show us that, that kind of inner conflict because it, in, in, in my view, it expanded the whole, uh, the whole problem, the whole uh, dilemma of, of radicalization and isolation into more than just a matter of us and them. It's also a matter of within us, mm. within them and within us. So, so I think that helps us understand the complexity of, of radicalization. Because we, uh, at least in Denmark and in the West, I think, have a tendency to, to see it as a very uh, black and white thing. Some people are evil and some people are good. The good people are always us for some reason. Uh, and, and the evil people do stupid stuff and they have to go to jail and be deported. Okay, that's more or less the, the, the consensus. But, but as we all know, if, if we really think about it, it's much more complex than that. And it's, all, it's about the, the inner conflicts and it's about the conflicts that are within them and within ourselves and how that interacts somehow. And for me, it's like uh, many young people, especially was Muhammad, they are confused about because they're trying to be westernized in the, in the beginning and they're trying to be the part of society and they still think that they are westernized because they're living there and they belong there. But when they come to the Somalian people, they will say, you are, you are not westernized because why they deport you if they want it? You, so he's like limbo where he's saying like, I'm not belonging here because the Westerners, they don't want me. They deport me about it and, or, or they hate me or they hate my culture or they hate my religion or, yeah, or the uh, local people in Somalia or our parents or they think like, or you westernized, but you are not, you don't know your religion, you lost, you don't know your culture, you don't know your language very well. So it's always like this confusing. So you always have to fight these two cultural and 
it's very hard to plan one of them because you have to find your own self, your own culture. Because in Somalia, because we have been civil war and you lose everything, the only thing you have the God. And sometimes the, our parents, they use it like, it's, oh, it's destiny. You did what you can, but you cannot run about destiny. But sometimes uh, young people, they need, they have so many power, they have so many energy, they want to try to change things, they want to make their own future, they want to decide their own self what happening tomorrow. They believe like, uh, I can decide my own uh, way to do it in my life. That's the problem, also conflict coming inside. And, but I understand many people are still Somalia because you don't have nothing else, mm -hmm. only, only God. And that's only you say it. it's destiny, everything, and easy to say it, to come out. And we show them, both of them, they like it, and they, they, they can see themselves. When you see yourself in the, in the screen or the mm. TV, you will see, you will get some idea. Oh, okay, this is what happened to me. It's like, um, but uh, Fatih life is now is better than, but Muhammad is in Somalia. He go back to back to Somalia. He live with his mother. And, uh, and, and he trying to survive day after day. And uh, Fatih, she living, she got she's apartment in, in UK and London. And she living there with her children. And they divorce, of course. Yeah. And you have to think about that these processes are long uh, from when we stopped shooting the film. And it's been 2017. Uh, 2017, yeah. It's so almost. Two years. Two years, yeah. So the lot March, of stuff happens. Yeah. 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 For me, f first of all, I, I sometimes you know, in your vanity, you think that uh, the film we did can change everything. But but when we look at, at it realistically, I think the best we can hope for is that some people get grasp the idea of complexity uh, and and allows themselves to think. Uh, a bit more about the complexity of the issue than just the black and white, as you say. Um, and that's because the, the Muhammad and Fatih let us in to their internal conflicts as well as the external conflict. That's, and that's why I think we, we can hope that if, if people actually sit down and see the film and maybe talk to their mates about it, uh, then they will uh, realize that, that the public debate that is going on in the media and when you listen to politicians who are equally radicalized as these young guys, they, they might think that, oh, maybe it's a bit more complex, a bit more nuanced than, than we are presented this idea. Because as you probably also experience here in the UK, at least in Denmark, we re really experience that Politicians are sort of competing with coming up with new hardcore measures, uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, almost biblical, and and uh, and and uh, that approach is uh, populistic, I think, and aims only to satisfy the lowest instinct among the voters. I'm sorry to say. Uh, and and uh, there are good people who are working with the with the radicalization in in sensible ways, but the politicians, uh, I'm afraid, are, are going for the easy solutions. And I hope that the film, I, I wish that the politicians would see the film also, mm. uh, to grasp that uh, that it's much more complex and much more interesting than the eye for an eye debate. I think we have to take these young children back again because it's our children, it's our society, they grow up and we have to take our responsibility as community and our country. And because I think about it's easier for us to know where they are if we don't know where they are. If they disappear or we don't know where they are, they can come back one day back again. For me it's like important to come to bring back again <coughs> and to put maybe in the court and to take their own uh, prison or wherever they put, but we have to pick, we have to take back again, I think. So that's the only way yeah, we can do it. We have, we have to, to, to show them in a very uh, concrete way that what we are claiming to defend, the democratic legal system, that it's also working for them. How, how, can, we, how can we convince them that that society democratic society 
is is valid for them if we say that but the rules doesn't count for you you have to you know you did something wrong now you can rot in hell i mean we are undermining the very principles that we are claiming to fight for uh, and we are losing the legitimacy that we need to have in front of these these young people that that uh, uh, there's a place for them in our society and if they do something wrong they get in front of a judge they get a sentence they do their time and afterwards they're equally human as everybody else mm. But we can also use yeah. them to prevent the another one, guys who yeah, will go exactly. there in the future. Or use like role model for them. Yeah. yeah. Just I the other that. day there was this uh, American guy who joined Al-Qaeda when he was young. And he got, uh, he got uh, captured by Turkish forces and sent to prison. He did eight years. And now he's working actively with, with, uh, with authorities in the U.S. to prevent other young people from getting radicalized. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote uh, a comment in the New York Times that was also printed in Danish newspapers that we have to take these young men and women back and show them what the, the values that we are actually uh, uh, claiming to fight for, what they are really worth and they, uh, that they count for them too. Mm -hmm. And also to draw from their experience. I mean, let's learn from why did they become radicalized? What happened during the radicalization? Also, in a very you know specific manner, what happened? How did you enter that organization? And and, and how you know what actually happens when a person gets radicalized? Uh, I think that what what uh, films and other kinds of expressions can do is to spark another kind of curiosity towards that issue. And I'm not saying like when they see our film, then the, it's a big epiphany and then and, and everything looks different for these people. But if you can just in some people spark another kind of interest, uh, another kind of curiosity into a specific problem, this, in this case radicalization, I, th I think that, uh, that's, um, that, that that's worth it. <laughs> and, and furthermore, I think it's, it has a value that, that um, the people that that this film is about, the young Somalis, their parents, their friends, their siblings, whatever, all the people around, also can feel that they're being seen and they're being heard, which is a very important thing, I think. Being seen and heard without being stigmatized as an automatic thing, but actually being seen and heard and recognize themselves in the film. Mm. I think that has a, a tremendous value as well. And for me, it's like uh, if I, it's for me the young people who want to go to this bad idea or Syria or wherever, um, Somalia, Afghanistan or Yemen, uh, they have to think about twice before they take this, this bad decision, and they have to think about the consequences they bring their own self and the family and the friends and the, the community. So and. And, and I need that one is the, the movies also give the community tools like talking about this issue and saying we have to take responsibility also about our society. Why are these young people going there? How can we prevent them? Why are our young people there? So much anger, so much hatred. Which kind of rule we have to play? And parents and children, they have to speak together and talk about this uh, issue and say, why are you looking this one and why are you going this friends? Why are you going this uh, places? Why are you hanging this bad uh, friends or something like that? So the the parents they have to be also know it where the children are going outside, who they are hanging out with them, and that's also very important and very to take about talk about. But in order to do that, I think it's important that the films don't stay in the nice art house art house theaters or in the nice universities or or uh, in, uh, in these uh, more cultural circuits, it's very important that the films get out there where the young people are, where they live, where they have their everyday life, where they have their discussions and their experiences with racism or with whatever. So uh, Nasib has done a, a, a huge job being out there, showing the film, um, uh, having the debate with people, and, and they show up and they... We had a big, we had a big uh, screening in, in Copenhagen, in one of these areas, 
and there was I think 700 people and they were standing in line at the microphones to say what they think and to to contribute to the debate and I wish that all those politicians had been there but they, they didn't come of course none of them mm. but but the the people who are actually involved in this and are, and are touched by this the mothers for example a lot of Somali mothers came to that venue and and talked and and uh, a lot of different people and that's what we need to do with these films and be careful that they don't don't stay in a, in a closed uh, circuit of uh, of well educated uh, white people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because the first one was like it was so much taboo to talk about al shabab or or you are working the police, or you are a spy, or everybody afraid to talk about it. Everybody like uh, this is sensitive uh, discussion to take about it, and nobody is like. Uh, and for me, it was it's, the beginning was like when we talk about it, it was like, oh, I don't want to talk about this because even you are afraid about the country you're living about it because uh, you, they think you sympathize Al Shabaab or you sympathize ISIS. So it's, now it's just like m people are more open and more talking about it and rela rela realizing about the problem is also our responsibility, our community and responsibility, our young people, why they do this and talk about it and don't be shame about it now because did I'm, many of us parents also they are shame about it because they don't want to talk about it because they just didn't go there and fighting for the war they run from away their own self and because did you bad parents or what look about society? What about looking about the country you're living? Did it feel like you are really class, your own child to go there? So many people, like, there was m so many shame before. I feel like now all this shame is out and everybody talking about it. Yeah, the first film was kind of an icebreaker, yeah. <laughs> uh, allowing yeah. for the next one to maybe dig deeper. Yeah. But I think in the, in the reception of the film, we have experienced to some degree that mm -hmm. that um, the the press in Denmark and the the, the 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 people of power in Denmark, there is some kind of feeling that that we are kind of apologetic towards Muhammad, and there's this uh, this feeling that. Uh, Oh, he did it on himself. Why should we listen to this guy? Uh, and and that's exactly what we are up against. And that's exactly why it's important to 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 make this kind of film. But uh, I think we could sense that there was a more like hostile. Yeah. And that's also how the times have changed. I mean, they have become more hostile and more radicalized during the the eight years yes. that we've worked with this subject. But I think the 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 way. The debate has uh, developed mm -hmm. during those years uh, is, a, is a key factor that it has become more radicalized. <laughs> the, the media, the politicians, as we talked about before, the, the media and the, uh, the politicians have also become more radicalized, which means it is even harder to get through with a message of nuances or with a message of uh, we need to look at this with a more open mind. Uh, than, than the eye for an eye rhetoric. Uh, how you, how you look, the, if, if you're one of these young guys or girls, then it, it's, 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 a, you know, it's very important how you looked at. And, and with the debate that is going on in Denmark right now, they are only looked at as a problem. And, and that's not only regarding uh, jihadism or, or radicalization, it's, it's in general. Yeah. Just, they are, from the starting point, a problem. And if you're, if you're taught that from your very small, that you are not part of the society, but you are a problem in the society, and, and what are we going to do with you? If, if that's the approach that you meet, I think there's, there's a bigger risk that you become hostile towards that society. But if you, and I don't know much about uh, uh, pedagogic, <laughs> you know, how, how you Social. actually, Okay. deal with. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a, a kindergarten teacher or, or whatever. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, how, how exactly. do, how do yeah. you actually deal with it on a professional level? I, I, I wouldn't be able to say, but, but, uh, but of course the, 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 the principle should be empathy, like you say. Empathy and, and, and uh, giving people a voice 
uh, giving them a chance to be heard and seen. Uh, some people in Denmark right now would call that hippie, hippie Halal. bullshit. <laughs> Halal hippie, that's a, that's a <laughs> phrase that is uh, used very often uh, when we when yeah when people like us talk <laughs> but uh, but i i nevertheless i think it 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 has to be the the way forward and it's not a matter of closing your eyes for the problems that are actually there as you said there yeah. are problems within the community like there are in every community and there's a responsibility that has to be taken by the community we talked a lot yeah. uh, with the somali community about that with the mothers and with with the, the the players the act, you know, who who are who are in that organization so yeah yeah so so it's not a matter of saying that uh, these people are innocent and we just need to you know be like soft and and all that it's, it, it that that would be a misunderstanding but it's it's uh, it's about building bridges it's about you know making it acceptable to be different from the from the ma majority. majority yeah. And also for me, it's like very important. It's like, in, in, it's easier to say like, this is a problem about immigrants, it's a problem about Somalia. But these young people, they are grow up in the Western country and they grow up our society. So, and they're going our school and they're going our education system. And maybe also works uh, system also. So, you cannot just throw out and say, we don't need you like that because you are garbage, something like that. But for me, it's like, even they're making bad decision, like every, every young people make it. You have to make empathy, you have to show them and you, they always get second chance in this society. Mm. And we have to accept it somehow, not in black and white. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and it's that thing that the consequences for these young people are so much greater than for other young people. Like, who doesn't who doesn't commit a crime, mm. <laughs> or, or like, or doesn't yeah. rebel? Maybe, maybe you guys didn't. And, and, <laughs> uh, and who? I mean, there's a lot of bad decisions being made. No, it's also in Mohammed's case, there's a mm -hmm. lot of bad decisions being made for him and for Fatih, by yeah. the way, also. Yeah during the way and 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 that you can see that afterwards but when when you are in the middle of it you make the decisions in 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 an attempt to do the right thing for your for your kid right mm -hmm. and then afterwards you can see oh that led to to these problems we should have done it different and that's it's a, that's a part of the the thing that we also need to learn from and they also need to learn from now it's talking about us and them but but we all have to learn from that mm -hmm. Well, I asked all my questions and I'm sure we'll have more tonight and you've been so great, guys. <laughs> Honestly, you're so Thank generous. You. You're so generous you're to welcome. give me so you're much welcome. time. <laughs> you cut it. <laughs>